What's up everybody, my name is Cairo and welcome to a beginner's guide to Substance Painter. So today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be working through a texturing project from start to finish and I'm going to be walking you through the basic workflow that we're going to be using, the UI elements and all the different neat little tricks that we can use with Substance Painter. So without any further ado, let's get started. This is the screen that you're going to be presented with when you open up Substance Painter. This is the default UI. I generally don't like to use the shelf down here, so I'm going to close that for the moment and I'll explain the function of the shelf at a later stage. So for now, what we want to do is we're going to go File and New Project. Another template we're going to be using is heavily dependent on what you would like to use these textures for. By default, it's set to Unreal Engine 4 preset. However, you can change this to a variety of other presets. The Unreal Engine 4 preset uses the PBR metallic roughness workflow. If you're not familiar with PBR, it stands for physically based rendering. And I'm not gonna spend too much time explaining it in this tutorial. That is certainly a different topic altogether. So if you're interested in reading more about that, be feel free to check out Wes McDermott's book on PBR rendering. It can be found on the Substance website as shown here. So we're going to be using the UE4 template and now we want to select the mesh that we're going to be using for the project. So you just hit select over here and I'm going to be using this Alder Dragon Mesh, the high poly version which can be found on Sketchfab and all credits must be given to the artist Eon who created it and it's a really, really nice model. So I was looking forward to texturing it. So here we have the doc document resolution, which is of course the size of the images that you're going to be exporting for each of your output maps. It's set at a 2K resolution for the moment. We're gonna keep it like that, but keep in mind that this can be changed at a later stage. The rest of these settings we're going to leave for now. The mesh maps and the baked maps can be imported at this stage. However, if you don't have them baked at this moment, like I don't, we are going to leave it for now. So we're just gonna hit OK and our model will import. So here we have our model. So this is the low poly version of the model that we're going to be working on. But of course we're going to be needing to bake the mesh maps. But first, before we get to that, I just wanna go through a few of the viewport navigation settings so that you have a bit of familiarity with that to work through with them. So I'm holding down Alt on my keyboard and left clicking to rotate the view of my model. You can hit Shift to snap it to any of these orthographic views. And then I can hold down Shift and the right mouse key to change the light source. I'm not going to be going through all of the shortcut keys for Substance Painter, there are a lot of them. I'm just going to be using the ones that you would most often and commonly use. However, if you hold down control on your keyboard, you will see that this context menu does pop up, which gives you a little bit of a better idea of all the different shortcut keys that you can use. So what we're going to do is, I just want to show you the different views that are available over here. I'm currently in the 3D view. We can go to 3D and 2D view which shows you both your UV and your model on the same viewport. If you hit F, it will zoom out to fit the whole model inside your screen and the same with the UVs. You can also go to F3, which will give you just your 2D view or F2, which I was in, which is just your 3D view. It just all depends whether you want to be painting directly onto your UVs or onto your model directly. So now that you have a bit of a better idea of how the viewport works, let's talk about the tabs that we have available here. So on the right hand side over here, we have the texture list. You can either choose to view or not view your model over here, depending on how it's divided up. If your model is divided into different materials, all of the materials will be listed here and you can preview them one by one if you so desire. But our model is just made up of one UV sheet and one material. So I'm just going to close the texture set list. We don't need it for now. And we might want to use the extra screen space. So here we have our layer stack, which is very similar to Photoshop if you've ever used that. It just has the list of all of our different layers and those can be also viewed separately or together. 
For now, though, we're going to go to our texture set settings where you can see all the output channels which we have available to us at the moment. We can add to these, but for now, we're just going to stick with the default settings. This is where we're going to bake our mesh maps. If you scroll down over here, you can see that none of our mesh maps have been baked, so none of them are available over here. So what we want to do is we're going to go bake mesh maps and this screen will pop up which allows us to apply the settings we want for our baking. So these are all the texture outputs that are going to be created as a result of the, of the baking process. But for now, we're not going to use the color map ID one the high poly model that the artist created for this mesh did not have any polygroups in ZBrush or whatever he used to create this model, so it doesn't have any color map IDs. So you can choose the output size over here. It's better to rather choose a higher resolution now and then downscale it at a later stage, but I think 2K should suit our purposes for now. We're going to keep the diffusion settings as default and you do have the option to, to bake a low poly mesh as the high poly mesh. It will just apply some ambient occlusion and different settings and outputs based on the low poly mesh. But we actually do have a high poly mesh, which is this one over here. So you're not actually loading the high poly mesh, it's just referring to the file. So we're not going to use a cage because we don't have a cage file. So we'll leave those front and rear distances as default. The only thing I do want to change now is I want to change match to by mesh name. The reason for this is this mesh of this dragon is not one contained mesh. It's actually made up of multiple different meshes and I don't want all the different meshes to affect the other meshes when baking. So for example, if I were to keep this as always, the teeth would contribute to the ambient occlusion and the normal map of on the lower jaw over there. So the model has multiple different meshes, so we're going to match them by mesh name. So we're going to bake our mesh maps, and after a while, this pop-up box will finish and you can just carry on. Okay, so it doesn't take too long baking at 2K, so you can just hit OK, and you can see the result of the baking that has taken place. You can definitely see the difference between the two. But now maybe we'd like to see the contribution that each of these maps has towards our model. So you want to be able to view your output channels separately. So if you look over here and click down, you can see that I'm currently viewing the material. But what you can do is you can also click down to view just the base color, of which we currently don't have one, and the height and the roughness and all of those, which of course we won't have any of those outputs yet because we haven't changed them. But you can also go to the mesh maps and view ambient occlusion, ID, which as I mentioned, we don't have, normal, world space, normal, curvature, and all those fun maps. Then you can hit M on your keyboard to go back to the show material view. You can also hit C on the keyboard to cycle through your materials. However, this will only cycle through your it'll only cycle through your single channels, not your mesh maps. Then you can hit M at any time to go back to your material. Okay, so let's get started. Let's go to our layer view and I want to delete this current layer because I want to explain the difference between two very fundamentally different types of layers that we get. So up top you'll see we have various different things that we can add over here. So the first two ones that I want to talk about are the fill layer and the paint layer. So first of all let's talk about the paint layer. So I'm going to add a new paint layer over here and then you can see that I need to go down in my properties and I need to assign this some properties. So over here you can see in this view over here, you can see that now when I paint it will affect the color, the height, the roughness, the metallic and the normal. You can select these as you wish. So for example, if I want this layer to only affect my base color, I can only have that and then you can see that the inputs disappear or you can have it affect everything. 
So now if I were to go ahead, change the color to red. Now, if I go ahead now, you can see that I can now paint on my surface. Let's talk through a few of the tablet settings that we have over here, if you happen to be using a tablet like I do. So you can see at the top over here, we have a pen pressure or sensitivity setting. So I can draw very softly or hard and it will affect the size of my alpha. And you can also set this to flow. So that if I draw softly, it'll also fade out the intensity and softly will do and hard will do the opposite. For now though, I prefer to keep the flow off and the size on. So now you can go up to here and change the size of your alpha, or you can hold down control and move your mouse left and right while holding down on the right mouse button. If I hold down control here, you can see control plus right, change tool size. But like I said, I'm not going to th go through all of those, just the very common ones. You can also hold down control and move your mu right mouse button up and down to affect the hardness. And then I believe you can rotate it with control and left mouse. But of course, these are all things that you may not even need. But now let's talk about the alpha, which is currently what we are painting with. So if I right click right now, we have all of these paint properties just previewed over here, but they're now just on my screen for ease of access. So it's exactly all of the same settings. So now what we want to do is this is our stroke or rather our brush, so we can change all of these settings over here. For now though, we're not going to worry about those. And let's go to the alpha tab. So now this affects what you are painting with your paintbrush, so to speak. So now I can choose from all the different preset alphas that Substance has. So for example, there we go. I now have this alpha to use. So you can change all of these different alphas, all of these different settings by right clicking and changing all of them. But of course now I'm just going to use the shape alpha. It's the default and it's the easiest to use. So that's a, that's a paint layer. What you can do with a paint or a full layer, which I'll cover quickly now, is you can use a stencil. So as the name implies, you can choose any of these alphas and let's find something like this, this dirt spot. And now you can see that the stencil is projected over your mesh and this allows you to paint only inside the white areas. So now you can see no matter how much I paint, no matter how much I move my, br my brush around, it's only going to paint inside those designated areas. Okay, so let's turn the stencil off. So that is the paint layer. But now I'm going to explain to you why the paint, la paint layer isn't so often used inside Substance Painter. So now this is my paint layer. Let's just quickly rename this. You can rename all of your layers as you would similarly in Photoshop or another simple program. I'm just going to switch between my tablet and my mouse quite a little bit, so there might be a little bit of delay. So this is our paint layer. So now you can see that if we turn this off and on, the effects of that layer are displayed on, on our mesh. So now I'm going to add a fill layer and I'm going to explain to you why I think a fill layer is a lot more, it's a lot more efficient and it's a lot more, you're able to change things more efficiently with the fill layer. So let's change that to fill. And you can now see because the fill layer is on top of our paint layer that we cannot see our paint layer. What we can do is we can drag this layer down so now that the paint layer is on top. So let's go to our fill layer. And now the obvious difference between the two is I do not need to paint with my fill layer. We can just do things automatically. So I'm gonna make this very rough and also metallic. So you can see how all the different properties are changed here. So the advantage to the full layer is that now I carry on working, I add some more layers and I change all of these. I change all of these properties, then I carry on working later and I've deleted some things. Now I decide, oh, I don't want this shiny green metallic dragon. I want him to be a little bit rougher and I don't want him to be metallic. 
So now we can go in and easily change those values and the whole process becomes a lot more iterative and you're able to change things much more quickly without having destroyed half your work. So essentially it's a non-destructive process. However, with my paint layer, I can go in and I can paint some more, but I cannot change the properties of the things that I've already painted. So for example, if I change this color to blue or purple, it doesn't change the properties of the things that you've already placed on your mesh. So for that reason, I find fill layers with the use of masks, which we're going to be talking about at a later stage, I th find them to a lot, be a lot more productive than paint layers. What you can do on your paint layer though, is if you want to erase what you've done, you can go to the erase tool over here and you can erase as you will. So that's the basic difference between the paint and the fill layers. So now what we're going to do is let's talk about the fill layer quickly. But what we're going to do with the fill layers, well, let me first of all delete this paint layer because as I said, I don't like to use them. For a fill layer, what you can do is you can use the material mode for a fill layer. So for example, I want this dragon to be made of gold. So now you can use the various different materials that have been provided with substance to allow you to quickly change and iterate upon your design. So for example, I can search gold and now I click on this and the gold preset has been, has been applied to our model. And then you can change the various parameters for that gold. So now let's say I wanted to change this to, what else do we have? We have skin over here. So we have lots of different skin presets. So let's go human foreskin, forehead skin. I mean, it doesn't look very good, but then again, it's a dragon, not a human. So now we have various different options that are provided to us through this material. So for example, we can change the skin color, we can change the roughness, and all the different parameters that have been provided through this material. For example, maybe I don't want to use the roughness from the skin, I want to use it from something else. So I could just click off that roughness, I could change that height, or I could not use the color if I want to. And then we also have the full projection settings and UV settings over here. So for example, let's use something that's quite noticeable here. So let's go, I think there's an aluminium aluminium insulator. So what if I want to change the scale of this over here, perhaps I want them to be a lot smaller, I can go up and change the scale of the UV transformation. So I can multiply this to make this a lot smaller. There we go. So we have a little bit of a better effect over here. Now what you can also do is you can change the UV wrap from repeat to none. So then if you go into your UV view over here, you can see that it's not tiling horizontally and vertically, it's only tiling once. You can change this to horizontally, to vertically, or to all over. You can also change the rotation of this, the offset, and all those other fun things. All of these transformations can also be applied inside the viewport over here. I can move this over here, can rotate it, can scale it non-uniformly so that these values are not the same anymore, and so on. And then the last thing I want to talk about is the projection mode. So for now you can see that this tileable material has been placed on our UV map uniformly. So for example, you can see that, let's find a good spot over here. You can sort of see that this tileable material is exactly in line with each other and they all continue. If there wasn't these gray areas over here, it would just be this tileable material. But because of UV unwrapping, you're going to have seams everywhere. So for example, on top of my back over here, you can definitely see that noticeable seam. So what you can do is change the projection mode from UV projection to triplanar projection. And this uses this gizmo over here to try and remove the seams. So now you can see I have no seam over here. I can move this gizmo around and you can see the changes in my UV channel. 
So you can see that it's trying to compensate for the different shapes of your mesh to try and get a uniform texture over all of it. So that's the basics of triplanar projection. You can hit E over here to rotate it and then W to move it around and then I believe R to size it, something like that. So the two basic forms of projection are going to be UV and triplanar. You can use planar by itself and spherical, but you're not going to use those as often. You can hide this gizmo by just clicking on this, and then you can see the results of your triplanar projection. So now we've talked about materials, but let's talk about smart materials for a second. So I'm going to delete this fill layer, and what you can do here is you can click here, and where is it? Add a smart material. So Substance has multiple different smart materials that you can use for your projects. So if we go here and we click on, what's this one? Creature skin, alien blue, creature skin, green smooth, that might work. And there you can see that the smart material automatically applies its own distinct colors and maps to your model. But the difference between a material and a smart material is that a material only has base properties. So let's add a full layer. Let's check. Let's click on a material quickly. So let's go with, I don't know, iron. And you have a few different options here. Well, let's go with iron diamond. Okay, it looks good. We can change this to triplanar projection if we want to. So the difference between this and a smart material is that we only have these base properties, which are useful, but they're not always going to be very instance specific. What I mean by that is they're not going to change, they're not going to change no matter what mesh you are working on. Whereas the smart material, you can already see it's taken some of our inputs in order to create colors and shapes that are more mesh specific. You can see that the nose has been darkened and some of the areas over here around the face. So what the smart material has done is it's just created a layer stack. So materials or smart materials are created by making multiple different layers with different inputs that affect the look of your mesh. And then after they've been made, they are just grouped in a folder like this, very similar to Photoshop once again. So those are smart materials, a very, very brief introduction to them. But now let's get into creating this dragon that we're going to end up with. So I'm going to delete the smart material and let's get to work. So we're going to be learning through examples here now. So first thing you'd obviously want to do with your dragon is you'd want to have the base color for the skin. So I don't want height and I don't want, well, I do want metal just so I can set it to zero. So let's choose a color. I'm thinking maybe, maybe a beige. And you can affect all of these colors using HSV values, hue, saturation, and the V stands for, uh, it slipped my mind now. I think it's value. So you can just, affect the vibrancy with this over here. So effectively how light and dark it is. So I think we're gonna use something like this, but of course this is much too shiny. So we're going to increase the roughness. Now maybe I want a little bit of a preview of what my roughness is looking like. So I'm gonna hit C and go to roughness and then you can see how the values change over here. Okay. So that looks good for our base layer, but now of course we're going to want to add more of them. So I'm going to name this as base properties. It's always a good idea to name all of your layers just so you know exactly what you're looking for at a later stage. Now of course it's always a good idea to save your projects before anything goes wrong. So I'm gonna choose save and compact, which just helps with the file size of this. So I'll just call this elder dragon 
Orange Substance Painter, whatever you want to call it, and that will save that. So now we want to add on to this layer that we already have, so I'm going to choose a fill layer. So now I'm going to call this color variation. But now if I were to change any of these properties, so for now example I just want color and roughness, and the roughness will be a bit darker, and the color will be something like that. But now, because the color variation is on top of the base properties, it's going to be placed on top of that, and then we can't see through to our beige sort of color. So now this is where masks come in. So we want this purple color to only affect certain areas. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to right click on our layer and say add black mask. And now because this is a black mask, it's saying, okay, don't use any of this layer anywhere. So we need to add white values to our mask so that it can define where we want to use this layer and where not. So if I hold down Alt and click on my mask, you can get a preview of the mask over there. So now you'll see I can paint on my mask and then when I hit M again, you can see that through my mask, everything has been revealed. And now why I chose to use the full layer, as I mentioned earlier, is I can now go in and very freely change all of these properties at any stage. But you don't have to paint on your, on your mesh. You can do various different things. So for example, we're going to add an effect over here. So we're going to add a paint layer. So then we can now paint on it as we will. You could also, if you wanted to, you could select by polygons. So there, this just allows me to select by the face of the mesh. This often doesn't provide the best results because you can see that because we're working only at 2K, you get some roughness to the edge of that. So I'm going to delete those. And we're going to use a paint layer for now. But you don't even have to use a paint layer. You can delete it by clicking on that X over there. And we're going to use a fill. So now at the moment, the fill is just a grayscale value between 0 and 1. But you can click on this here and choose a fill. So I think what I want to do is I'm going to use a clouds texture. So let's use clouds 3, something like that. And then you can change the different parameters of the clouds over here by affecting the balance and the contrast and things like that. Okay, but now once again, you can see that we're getting these ugly seams over here because of how my mesh is divided up. You can see it on the horns over here. So let's go to triplanar projection. That helps with those seams a little bit. And let's change the tiling of this so that it's not so big, something like that. Okay, so now we have a bit of color variation. Of course, this isn't going to be our final color, but like I said, we can change it at any time. Let's get something like this going. Something like that. Doesn't really matter for now. For now, we're just experimenting. So we have this color variation over here, but you'll notice that it's very prominent on the surface of the model. So as you can see over here, there's a little 100. And this is similar to the op opacity slider inside Photoshop. So I can turn this down or up as I want. So for now, let me just look at my base color. Base color looks something like this. OK, so if I affect this, you can see that it goes from 100% opaque to 0. And you can choose which one suits you best. OK. But now let's get into the more interesting stuff with masks. So for now, we have a fill. But let's add a, another fill layer. And let's call this color variation 2. And let's just affect the color with this. We don't want to affect anything else. And I'm going to make this white. And I'll show you why now. So what we can do is we can add a black mask like we did earlier. And then we're going to add a fill. But now we're going to use the ambient occlusion map that we baked earlier. 
So now if I hold Alt and click, you can see that my mask is just exactly the same as my ambient occlusion mask. But we want to edit this to work in our favor. So I can add something else to this layer stack by adding a levels. So now if you don't know what a levels is, it basically allow allows you to alter the black and white and gray values of any input map. So if I go to just my mask view here, if I so you can see on your levels you have black, white, and gray on the top and black and white on the bottom. And this graph gives you a rough indication of how your values are spread. So if I drag the middle gray value closer to there, you can see that my gray values get closer to black. If I, if I do the opposite, you can see that my gray values get closer to white. Then if I do this, all of my black values get more black, all of my white values get more white. And then the bottom here, it's just a general multiplier, I guess you could say, of your levels. So now, I want color inside the crevices of my model. So what I can do is I can invert this mask by just switching these two around. And now you can see the white areas will be affected and the black areas not. So you can see that I only have white where I have ambient occlusion. So it just allows you to add something a little bit more. So now I just want to edit this a little bit. So I want very, very subtle. I can even do this if I want to. Something like that. There we go. So now you can see I only have white in the areas that are specified, but you can definitely see the pixelation from those soft shadows. So I just want to add a filter, and this allows you to do a variety of different things, which we'll cover throughout the duration of this video. But for now, I just want to use a blur, which will just allow me to blur that a little bit. Now I don't want it this intense, so I'm just going to change that to 0.2. And now I will show you the reason why I wanted this to be white. So now you can see that it says normal on top of all of my fill layers over here. So what we can do, very similar to Photoshop once again, is you can change the blending mode to normal, pass through, disable, or anything else that you can think of. So now, for example, I want to use subtract. So what that does is it will take all the values for all the masks below this and it will subtract the white color from them which means I will end up with a, pl a pure black value, essentially. We don't want a pure black value, so I'm just going to take that down until it's just a nice brown or something like that. And I think I want a little bit more of my ambient occlusion th showing through, so we're going to use something like that. Okay, so if I go back to my material view, this is how it's looking at the moment. You can also use the blend to say linear dodge add that will make everything white because you're adding all of those values. You can use multiply, you can use pass through, whatever you want. But for now, like I said, we're going to be using subtract. Okay, so now at this stage, I like to get the rough materials masked out inside my viewport. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add, let's say, three new full layers. And I'm going to call this horns. I'm going to call this teeth. And I'm going to call this eyes. So for the teeth, that's pretty easy. We're going to add a black mask. And then we want to paint in that black mask. So I'm going to go F1. And I know in my UVs, all of my teeth are over here. So I'm just going to use the polyfill. Make my life a little bit easier. And then I can switch to paint if that's a little bit easier. Oh, 
also something to note with the polyfill tool is that if I were to go over here, you can see that we have different options over here. You can use the full mode, which can use triangles. This is a quad mesh, so we don't have, well, we shouldn't have any triangles, but I'm sure I do some way or other. You can fill quads, you can fill, I think it's the entire mesh, and you can also fill UV chunks. So for example, I can fill just that one if I want to, or just that one. Okay. Now you'll see that I have some faces over here that I'm pretty sure I didn't select. And the reason for this is because of the brush mode that I'm using. So let's go to black, which is of course is the fill over here. And let's paint. And now I just want to use black everywhere so that nothing is selected. So now let me show you what I mean by this. So I'm going to switch back to white. You can press S, X on your keyboard to switch between black and white. I'm going to be using that one a lot. So now I'm just painting on my teeth, but you can see that other areas of the mesh are affected. This is because if you right click and go to your brush, I'm using the alignment using tangent wrap. So what this does is, let's go to my material here. Say if I paint on both the bottom and top lips at once, like this. If you now go to your mask view, so let's see where that is, let's paint. You can see that it's affecting over here and over here at once. That's because we're painting on the 3D model. What we can do is we can change this alignment to UV. So now, if I paint on this, it's only going to paint on the UV map that I'm currently on unless I specifically pass all the way over into the other seam. So now if I paint on this, it's not going to affect anything else except that UV, so long as I keep my mouse within the bounds of the UV shell. So that's just a little bit of background info on that if you're wondering why you have some of your masks that are painting over other things. So I want to, let's just delete all of this. Let's make sure we're in our paint layer. Okay, so I want to select with this, but let's make sure that we're in the, we're in UV mode. Okay. So now we have all of our teeth selected, go back into paint mode. So now let's hide the eyes for now and let's hide the horn. So now you can see we just have our teeth selected. So we can go ahead and set some, some roughness and color values. So we can go check out our roughness here. I think this is fine. Let's change this to a bit more of a yellow tinge maybe. There we go. Okay, so we're shaping up. Let's go do the eyes quickly, add a black mask as always, and we don't even actually have to add a paint layer if we just want to polyfill, so let's just do that. I know my UV chunk is here, so there we go. Eyes. Now, I want to make a little bit of an evil looking dragon, so we're going to go into the base color, don't want those, we want this to be perfectly smooth because they're eyes. And let's bring this down to a darker value. There we go. We can worry about the pupils and stuff at a later stage. So now, I need to mask out these horns. So let's bring these back in, add a black mask as we do. But now I can't really polyfill these horns because the way I've unwrapped them they don't always align with the normals and in some of these smaller horns they just don't line up very well so if I would try to polyfill them like this I still have my UV chunk selected so I don't want that so let's go here let's try do some of this like that so if I try to create a mask for my horns like this it wouldn't look very good because just because of how the polys are placed so in this case this is one of those times where you would actually have to go in and hand paint all of these different horns this is why in ZBrush you'd want to actually have your 
you'd want to have your polygroup set up properly so that you can have different materials for your horns and your skin and your eyes and everything else so that you don't have to do this. So for now, what we need to do is I'm going to create a paint layer and make sure I'm on white and then let's go into this mode and then you can also zoom in with alt and the right mouse and I'm just going to change the side and what I'd have to do is or what I did do is I had to manually paint out these horns but for the purposes of this video we don't want to do that because it does take a very long time so what I'm going to do is I'm going to import a custom mask for myself to use so I'm going to go file import resources add resources and I'm going to import this mask that I've made called a horns mask so now you can see that you can put in an optional prefix or path for this I don't want to do that and I want to use this as a texture so I'm going to click that now I can import this to either the session which means that it will remove this file as soon as I close this version of substance painter or I can add it to the project, which means it will always be available at the project. This is what I want to do. So I'm going to hit import. So now, instead of using paint, let's use a fill layer. So I'm going to go in here and search for horns underscore mask. So if I click this, you can now see that all of my horns are nicely masked out. So let's go ahead and choose some properties for this I think they should match the teeth but maybe a little bit darker maybe a little bit of a brown color okay and then we want them to be quite rough but not as rough as the skin something like that maybe now we can go ahead and we can just move our camera around, get an idea of how the light is interacting with our model. And it's looking quite good. So now this is where we go about and we create some real variation with the material. Ooh, those teeth are looking much too bright. So I'm going to bring this down and bring the saturation down as well. That looks a little bit better. So now we need to really push the diffuse or the base color on this so that we start to get a more realistic result. So for now we have our color variation two, which adds some darkening over here, but I don't think it's enough. So I'm gonna go back and now you can just change this a little bit just to get a better result. Now, for example, I might decide I don't like the look of this red splotchy look so I can always go back into my color variation and change whatever grunge I want to use so maybe not clouds 3 maybe clouds 2 okay so I can bump up the contrast here remember to make the balance a bit less perhaps Okay, something like that. I think this is standing a bit much on the skin. Maybe I want to make this a bit darker. But like I said, that's the really, really powerful thing about Substance Design is that you can really tweak this as you will at any stage of the project. Let me just go ahead and save before I forget. And let's continue. So now in the original project that I did, which was shown at the beginning of this video, I had a little bit of color variation down on the throat. So now let's get into some of the advanced masking that we can do. So I want to go this to go on top of all of my color variation, but below the horns. So I'm going to make a new layer over there and we'll call this neck color. Oops. Okay, so let's create a mask as we always do. So now I'm going to paint in what I want over here. And I'm going to do this and I don't want this to affect anything. So I'm just going to paint in over here. Now, of course we have our brush set to UV. I don't want that. I want it back to tangent planar. So we get something like that.
Okay, so this is what our base color is looking like at the moment. Okay, so now even when we go in and we change the neck color to match what we want, I think this should be a little bit rougher, or maybe actually less rough. How's our roughness looking over here? Okay, let's make this a little bit less rough so we can have some shine there. Now it's very obvious that I've just painted this on. The fall off from the brush helps a little bit, but it's not going to do all of our work for us. So now the nice thing about the mask is that they also have blend modes. So now for example, we have this paint. So now if I were to add a fill, it would automatically fill the entire mask. But if I were to set that to multiply, let's show you the difference. So this is our paint by itself. Now this is our fill set to multiply because the fill is currently just a uniform color of 0.5, it's going to multiply by 0.5. But now if we use a grunge map, so let's search for grunge and let's look for something that might approximate skin. Maybe this one. So now it gives you some much needed variation in your color and in your roughness on the neck over here. So we can, as always, change these parameters, the contrast, and the tiling. So I think two is probably a good value. And then of course, let's change the color over here. Let's have a look at our Diffuse, this is obviously standing out a little bit, so we can change the blend mode down. Okay. Not really liking that grunge, it's not looking natural enough, so. Grunge dirt, maybe that does look better, I think. So let's go to five. There you go. I think that looks a little bit better. Now we want to create some more color variations. So um, let's do this over here. So let's call this color lighter. Add a black mask. And it's important to keep in mind that you don't just have to blend your base color. So for example, let me show you what I mean by this. Let's go to add a paint layer. I just want to add some, some stripes up and down the side over here, maybe on the back a little bit. So it's really nice to just mask out the rough areas that you want to use for your mask because when you multiply your masks, you're not going to see these rough sketch outs here. So what I can do is same as last time, I can add a fill set to, to multiply and let's search for spots maybe. There we go. Change the scale up a little bit. There we go. And then we can change the hardness and shape. And let's change this to UV map. Maybe let's change this to UV projection. It makes it just a little bit less obvious that it's tiling. Okay. So we can change the base color to maybe like an maybe an orange or something like that. And now because the roughness is so different over here, it's gonna show quite a lot. So let me just look in this view. There we go, something like that. So now what I was saying about the blend modes, it doesn't only have to be for the base color, it can be for the roughness as well. You can see now we've got some reflections going on here because the roughness is so low. So I would like my roughness to be a little bit rougher than the rest so it doesn't cast as many reflections but I don't have to go in here and set this as higher than the rest let me show you what I mean we're now working in the base color tab but we can switch to roughness and now of course all of our roughnesses are set to normal 
with this one we can add set to add so now if I go back to base color and go to my roughness so now it's going to add 0.57 to the current values if I go to this uh, I'm in the wrong view sorry this one it's going to add 0.8 to all of my values here it's going to add zero so if you just want to add a little bit of roughness you just have to add a little bit of roughness there okay so what else can we do to make this a little bit more appealing let's work with height a little bit so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to copy my horns so I can right click and say duplicate layer now I want to get some height in on these horns because they're looking quite smooth so what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply a fill multiply and now we just need to look for a grunge that looks kind of like horns I suppose not really horns I just want to get some nice lines in there so I cannot see what this looks like. Okay, maybe. Just gonna need to change the scale. Okay, that actually looks quite good. So now I want this to affect the height and the color. So not the roughness. So let's change this to a bit of a darker color. There we go. We're getting to get some variation in those horns. And now I want to affect the normal map. So the way we do this is by using the height channel over here. We can use the normal, but that's more for placing decals on the surface of the mesh. So what I mean by this is if we go over here to our, you can see this is our normal map. This is our normal plus height plus mesh. So this takes into account whatever we change on the normal map, on the height map, and on our baked mesh map. So that's why we're going to be working on the height channel. Now I want these grooves in this mask, I want them to recess into the horn a little bit. So all I need to do is I need to go in here and I need to change the height. Now of course I only want this to happen the tiniest amount. So let's go negative 0.02. Now if we go to our height plus mesh, you can see that the changes are reflected here. So it depends if you want a more powerful normal map or not. I don't think it works really well, so let's go negative 0.04 maybe. So you can just really play around with these and see how it feels. Okay, so we've definitely got a lot further than well we've come a long way since we started so let's go ahead and start making this look a little bit more believ uh, believable so I want to add some darkness to the horns so let's go add a new layer say head darkness your names don't have to make sense to anyone except you I suppose so let's go in and paint. So I just want to do this. And this might be a prime usage example for using the UV alignment because now I can just paint on that UV without having any risk of painting on anything else. Whoops. So as long as you make sure to keep your mouse over the horn or your tablet or whatever you may be using, you're not going to have any risk of overlapping onto other things. Okay, let's add a little bit more here. So from here on out, it basically just becomes a process of adding more layers, adding more masks, and altering your mask in different ways so as to create a visually appealing and cohesive image. So I want to 
Let me rethink my color palette a little bit here. So let's make this red, obviously much too vibrant over here. And now the beauty of Substance Paint is now I've decided I don't want a brown dragon anymore. I want a green dragon. So I'm going to go back down in here and change the color to a nice green, maybe a nice dark green. Obviously bring the saturation down a lot, the vibrancy down a lot. And I want to change that color variation to orange. Okay, so then let's change, what was it, was this one? Let's change that to a dark green. Yeah, the blue is also looking kind of nice. But I think let's stick to a darker green. Down. And there we go. I just want to decrease the saturation on this. Because if you look at your base color, you can have a general idea of how things should look. And you don't want things too saturated. Okay, so now let's go back to this head darkness. So first of all, what we can do is we can bring the saturation down. We can change the blending down a little bit. Actually, I want this to be red as well. So you can really see what I mean by changing on the fly. I don't really like that pattern, so I might have to go in and change it, who knows? So, you can see even the bottom is looking a little bit better than it did before with the other color. Okay, I just want a little bit more contrast between these two, so I'm gonna, there we go. So now we've added a lot of darkening colors, let's add a little bit of lightness. So I want this to go, Over here, so I'll just call this dappling. Add a black mask, and now what I want to use is the curvature mask because the curvature mask gives you a really cool way of controlling the highs and the lows of your mask. So the curvature by itself, so you can see wherever there's something that's been really like raised and beveled and curved, it's going to be white. So you can really use this to take advantage of the high points of your mesh. So, of course, I'm going to add a levels like I did last time, and now I can do something like this. So now I just want these to be, these to be white. And then I'm going to add a blur like I did the previous time, because when using your mesh maps, things get tend to get a little bit pixelated quite quickly. Something like that. Okay, so I want to set this to, let's go to add. Bring this all the way down, you're going to get a very subtle color variation there, and I quite like it. You can also change these values by typing them in. So I think something like that looks quite good. Okay, so my horns darkness, I want to add a fill layer set to multiply. And I want to give this a grunge as well. So let's go to grunge, choose a random one. Nope, that sort of looks natural. Maybe that one. So it's just a case of really going through, playing with all of these and making them work for you. Okay, let's change this pattern to something else. So because I already have my paint layer set up, I don't even need to change that. I just need to change the grunge that I'm using. Let's try something like that. Ooh, okay, that looks a little... Maybe we can add a little bit of height to these. 
There we go. Okay, obviously not quite so much. Okay. Now if you change the balance, it'll affect where you have, so if you set the balance all the way to one, you can see the stripes that I painted with my paint. So it's really affecting the multiply here. So now we can go back with our paint, change this to arrays, and now I can set this back on, mask some of these out. Oh, that's maybe a little bit small. Okay, we don't want that on. Actually, this might be a good opportunity to showcase something else. So I'm just going to undo everything I've done there. We can add another fill layer over here and set this one to subtract. So let's get another grunge grain. Maybe this one. So now with the subtract, it's now subtracting this grunge from everything else. So if I take this up, we can change the scale. So it really does provide you with a lot of power to what you're wanting to do. I think adding height to this might be the what reason why I'm not liking it. And it's a little bit obvious. Okay. Now we can go in, paint some more in if we want to. And the nice thing is because we've put our horns on top of this, it's never going to show up on top of our horns. Okay, so what can we do next? So far it's looking quite good. I want to add some veins to that neck color, so veins, and let's find something that looks kind of like veins. I'm pretty sure there's a grunge that could work well for this. Marvel veins. Okay, this kind of works, but not really. So what I'm going to do is change the scale. And now, of course, we don't want this everywhere, so I'm going to mask this out. So let's say we want some veins here. Am I on UV paint? I am. Let's go into tangent planar. Put some over there. There. Maybe the skin over here is a little bit more, a little bit more shiny, a little bit more translucent. So we can add some veins over here. Okay, and maybe I want to change this to a triplanar projection. But now you'll definitely notice that these are very straight. They don't really look like veins at all. So what I can do is I can add a filter and that filter is going to be a warp. So what the warp does, it just takes a Perlin noise and it warps it. So something like that gets my mask a little bit more. So this is without the, the warp and this is with, so it does make it a look a little bit more like veins, but maybe the warp is a little bit intense. So it's like this. I want this to be a little bit smaller. Okay, so let's go through here and take some of these out.
just to get a little bit more randomness and variation in. Okay. Now, of course, we want these to be the appropriate color, so let's look for a nice blue. There we go. Always make sure to refer back to your base color whenever possible. This is obviously way too saturated and not dark enough. I think here is a prime use case to add some height. Okay, let's just add very little there. And actually on our neck maybe as well, let's add some height. Just get a feeling of rougher skin. There we go. That looks a little bit better. Yes, I think it definitely does. Okay. At the grand scheme of things, maybe that's a little bit high. So let's bring it down a little bit. Okay, here's how everything is looking on our normal map. Okay, let's go back to those veins. How are they looking? A little bit bright, so let's bring these up here. Okay. Okay. So I think we've gone through most of what I wanted to cover. This is basically just showing you how you can really, really apply Substance Painter in any way that you want. So now I think before we end this, let's go through and do a little bit of hand painting of the scales and then we'll do the eye color and then I think we should be more or less done with this for now. And of course you can change this as much as you want. You can edit this as much as you want there's really no limit to what you can imagine with this so let's make a few final tweaks but i think our little dragon over here is looking quite good um i'm going to change this grunge because i'm not really feeling it i want some, something a little bit more a little bit more streaky something like this that looks good i think so let's go balance up contrast Something like that. Okay. What else did I want to do? I wanted to do some scales. So scales obviously have to go on top of everything. So, so I want the scales just to be a little bit shinier. So I'm just going to actually have to hand paint them. So let's not affect the color. I just want to affect the roughness of these. So paint. Roughness. So maybe something like that is a little bit too rough. So let's go something like that. Okay, let's just erase all of that that I did there. Okay, so now we'll get the tablet out. This texture is looking a little bit low res. We might actually just want to up this to 4K at the earliest opportunity. All I'm doing now is I'm just going to go ahead and add some roughness variation to these scales. Because all in all, our dragon is rather rough. He's not reflecting too much. So this might just make him a little bit more interesting. So you'll notice it might be a little bit difficult to picture that this roughness is changing. So let's give it a color visualizer just so I can more clearly see what I'm painting. So you can see I missed out a few spots here. So let's go over them.
Okay, I think you get the idea. Basically, you can create as much roughness variation as you want, and that just gives you something a little bit cooler to look at. Okay, what is one of the last things that I want to do? Let's look at this lighter color is looking a little bit a little bit strong. Hmm. Kind of like that. If we can get some sort of let's make this a little bit more green. Bring down that saturation. Let's look for dots. Spots. There we go. It's just something to look at, basically. By moving these up and down in your layer stack, you can see what is affected. So maybe that's... That's a bit big. Okay. So I'm going to do the eyes and then I think we're going to be done. So for the eyes, I'm just going to use a paint layer because why not? It's our last stage. We might as well keep things simple at this time. Make sure I'm on tangent wrap and I don't want this. Okay, so what you can do is, one last little tip, is you can activate symmetry. So if I press this button over here, you can see this red line gets drawn down the middle of my model, and then symmetry is activated. So now, whatever I do on either side, I should probably give this brush, this paint layer, some properties. So let's... Go ahead and do that. Paint layer. Why is it not giving me? Because we're on a razor, of course. Okay. So um, I just want color for the eyes. So let me just demonstrate demonstrate the symmetry. So whatever I do over here is done over there as well. Now this model is not perfectly symmetrical, so the model itself, not the method that I'm using. So I don't think I can use this method to do the eyes. Let's try it anyway. I, yes, you can see it's a little bit off center, so I'm not going to do that. So you can turn symmetry off, and I want to change this to, bit of a light, gold and I'm going to turn the hardness up there we go okay so because I wasn't working on UV mode there you can see some of that color spilled out over so what I want to do is I just want to go erase that so I just need to find um, where would that color be? There we go. Are we not on UV? Sorry, we're on tangent. I want to be on UV. And where's this one? This one's kind of small. I can just do that by hand. No one's going to notice. Okay. Now, because we're on paint mode, we can just go and change things up straight away. Let's go down to black. Then we can just hand paint this in, basically. Okay, 
Okay, so there we have him, our dragon more or less done. So now straight away, at the end of this whole process, you can see if there are things that you'd like to change. If there's nothing that you'd like to change, then you can just go ahead and export everything. But the first thing I notice is these horns. The height is obviously a little bit rough on them. So let's go negative north of 25. That looks better. The horns darkness, I think it looked better when it was just a bit of a gradient. So I'm going to delete that. The everything else looks pretty good. You might want to go in and just change the colors if you want to. You can change the patterns that you want to use. Anything that you want to can really be changed at any time. So for example, just for look, look dev purposes, you might want to decide your dragon's a little bit more friendly. You can straight away go change that white, that eye color to white. He straight away looks a little bit less menacing. Um, you can always go into your paint layer and give him some nice circular pupils, whatever you want to change. For now though, I think this is the end of this beginner's guide to substance paint. So thank you very much for watching. I hope that you found it to be quite concise and walking through exactly what you needed to know inside Substance Painter. And I hope that it serves you well in everything that you attempt to do in the software. It's a really great software. I really encourage you to get your hands on it and to get familiar with it. Thank you very much for watching and have a good one.